It's leveraging online tools and platforms such as LinkedIn to attract, teach, and engage your target and buyers in order to have more sales conversation. And the last part is the most important part. In order to have more sales conversations, LinkedIn and social selling can boost or enhance all of your other sales activities. Everything that you've been taught to do, whether it's personal meeting people, whether it's cold call techniques or calling techniques or networking te techniques, that can all be enhanced with social selling and with LinkedIn. Welcome to the Boss Podcast, the best of social selling. Your host, Mark McGinnis, Australia's number one social seller, author of Tactical Pipeline Growth and B2B Sales Trainer, brings you expert opinion, tactics, and discussion to help you get more out of your time on social. Bill McCormick is a social selling trainer from Social Sales Link. In this episode, we discuss how to create a conversation from almost every connection request that you receive. It's a great play, and it's really simple to implement. Bill has some really strong feelings about connection requests and network building, which I found very easy to agree with. Having recently spoken to both Bill and Bryn Tillman from Social Sales Link, I really like the way these two keep social interaction engagement as simple as possible. I mean, why create a massive marketing campaign strategy when we don't need one simply to start valuable sales conversations one-to-one? -one? I'm 100% sure you're going to love the simplicity of Bill's ideas in this podcast. In other news, I'm delighted to announce a treat for our supporters and our regular listeners. Bonjoro, the video application that increases your response rates by 300%, the one which I use for my outreach, has allowed us to provide a coupon code exclusively for our boss listeners. Listeners can now get a massive 20% off any Bonjoro membership by simply using the code BOSS20 at the checkout. Thanks to the wonderful crew at Bonjoro for the support. And now let's zoom across to the conversation with Bill McCormick from Social Sales Link. Welcome to the Boss Podcast, the podcast that helps you become better at using social for sales and lead generation. Today, we have another in what we call our expert series. This is where we bring in an expert to tell us about a particular aspect of the social space or to share their very best social strategies. So, of course, in order for us to do this, we need an expert. So, I'm very pleased to say that today we have Bill McCormick from Social Sales Link to talk to us today. Hello, Bill. How are you? Hey, Mark. How are you? Thanks for having me on. Absolutely awesome to have you on, man. I really appreciate it. I want to start with something a little bit out of left field, Bill. Doing my research with, you know, online, as you do as a salesperson, looking at your LinkedIn, I see that we've got something in common, and that is that you were a termite technician. Can you tell me a little bit about that very quickly? I was. Um, you, you, funny, because it, it kind of goes with sales. I was in, involved in sales early in my career in the 80s and 90s, and it, I found my way to a, a pest control company, and I was doing commercial sales. And I was so bad at it, they actually made, demoted me and made me a technician. And I found out that I was really good at selling when I could provide value to people. And one of, one of the values I provided was to be able to get rid of their termites for them. And so, yeah, so I, I spent many a day in a crawl space underneath the house with a lot of chemicals. And that's back in the days when they used to use chemicals to kill bugs. Uh, they don't so much do that anymore. But uh, yeah, that, that was kind of the beginning for me. Yeah, interesting stuff. So I bought a house in 2005 here in Sydney that was um, riddled with termites. So I did a termite detection course and termite eradication course so that I could see if they were going to come back. And, and, and I still go down to that house. I still own that house. And I go down and crawl underneath the floor and, and have a look every now and again. So there you go. There's something crazy that we've got in common. You would never think. Another tick for LinkedIn. Yeah. So, Bill, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about the, your business? Sure. So um, I've been uh, with Social Sales Link since 2018, since the fall, but I've been using LinkedIn since about 2014, 2015. And uh, 2013, my wife and I started our, our own business in the print and promotional products industry. So, you know, people are familiar with swag. That's what we did. We provided companies with 
you know, T-shirts and mugs and writing instruments and anything that they could put their name on. But we had to start our company from scratch. My wife worked for another company and she left that company to start this one. And what we discovered really quickly was that LinkedIn was where our clients were. And so we were looking for people in marketing and lo and behold, marketers love LinkedIn. And so I began to look and read anything that I could find about LinkedIn. And it led me to this really cool book called The LinkedIn Sales Playbook, A Tactical Guide to Social Selling by somebody named Bryn Tillman, but I'm pretty sure I didn't pronounce her name that way the first time that I, I read it. And I actually read that book cover to cover and put everything into, into practice to the point where I contracted another LinkedIn trainer to help me at one point a little later after that. And that person looked at my, in fact, I think she's been on your podcast, Vivica Von Rosen. Oh, uh, yep. Yep. Yeah. So she looked at my profile. She said, Bill, I can't help you. You know, you've got it. Your profile is really optimized. And so what had happened was in the print and promotional products industry, people began to ask me how I was building our business so, so quickly. I mean, at one point, about four years in, I could look back at our sales and attribute over $400,000 in sales to LinkedIn being part of the sales process and not to mention about 25 to 30 new clients. And so people would ask me all the time, you know, how are you doing this? So I began to consult with people at first for free. And then a, a buddy of mine said, hey, he did website design. He said, hey, why don't you make some videos and we can sell them on a website? I'll set the website up and uh, you, you learn how to train. And so we, we both went out and learned our different parts of it. And we started on that road of, of selling video training, which didn't really work too well. But as a side note, 30% of our promotional products business is in Bermuda. So uh, I got to go to Bermuda quite often, still get to go down there, thankfully, except for COVID. But, but what happened was one of my clients down there was a large bank and they, they knew I was doing LinkedIn training and they were interested in it. And so I had no idea how to price it out. I had no idea how to do sales team training. I was very good at coaching people one-on-one. -on -one. So I was part of a chat group on LinkedIn that Bryn Tillman had set up. I don't know how she found me to add me to it, but she called me an expert. So I was like, I'm not going to argue with Bryn Tillman if she's going to call me a LinkedIn <laughs> expert. She, you know, she knows. And so in that group, I just put it out as a general question to everyone. You know, Mark, that's one of the things I love about our industry as LinkedIn trainers is we're so collaborative and we're so willing to help each other. And so I put this question out, you know, I've got this bank sales team that wants some sales training and I need help with it. And Bryn was the first one to say, hey, let's jump on a call. I'd, I'd be happy to help. And uh, at first we were just going to white label her training and, and we were going to do a revenue sharing. But we actually met in person down at the LinkedIn offices in New York City in the Empire State Building. We were there for the events launch back in November of 2018 or October, sometime around there. And kidding around, I just said to her, hey, so does this mean that I can put social sales link on my experience section on LinkedIn? And I was really just joking. And she turned to me, she said, yeah, she says, you can join the team if you want to. And so long story short, or maybe longer, you know, she invited me to join the team and I did. And we began to work together really closely. And uh, I, I love it. I, I really don't do much now with promotional products at all. But I'm really every day working with people and working with Bryn. Uh, we're just getting ready to launch a, a, a coaching, um, a, a monthly coaching subscription plan uh, in the next few weeks that uh, her and I are partnering on. And we've done some video work that lives on a few different websites. We've co-taught that together. And uh, I just love my job and love doing that each and every day. No, oh, fantastic, Bill. That's such a great story. And, it's, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people over the time that I've been running this podcast. And one of the things that keeps popping up is variations of this story that, well, that, that in fact, both you and I have got. You know, it's like we, we needed to start a business or drive sales quickly. And we ended up on LinkedIn as the most effective platform available. I know when I started my business, I didn't actually have a preference for social. In fact, I wasn't very active on social media at all. It just seemed like the most effective vehicle for me to use. And again, you're saying exactly the same thing. It's crazy. Um, and I'm still surprised that there's so many people that aren't embracing social, particularly when so many of their clients are on LinkedIn. It's very interesting. Good to see. It blows me away that people kind of refute it or resist it so much 
And I think, if anything, what the last 100 days has shown us with, with what's happening with COVID and with lockdowns and quarantines is that we have to be, while we're being physically distanced from people, we have to be socially connected. And if you want to be socially connected in the, in the business to business sales world, then really LinkedIn is the place where you have to be and you have to have a strong presence and you have to have a general understanding of how to use it the right way because there's so many people using it the wrong way. Yeah. So let's dig into that a little bit, if you don't mind. So what are some of the things that you see that people are doing the wrong way? One of them is they're treating LinkedIn like they used email back when email first came out. You know, you get email blasts from companies pitching their products and you've never heard of them before. So when you're doing that company to company, that, that's one thing. But when you're doing it person to person, and that's really what LinkedIn is. When you look at LinkedIn, you have to look at it as a personal networking room that's got over 700 million people in it that's open 24-7, 365 days a year. You know, the fact that you and I can talk and I'm in Catskill, New York, and you're in Australia, you know, that just blows me away. But we're talking one on one. Yeah. And so what people are doing is, first of all, they're either connecting with trying to connect with other users by pitching their product, which becomes, you know, Mark, if I reach out to you to connect with you and it's all about me and my product and my service, what is the chance that you're going to actually want to even listen to me? Because all it is is a sales pitch. And so, so people are doing that. People are also connecting without a personal note. And if you happen to take the bait and accept that connection request, then they're pitching. They're, you know, look what I can do for you. Look how great my product is. Look how great my service is. And I don't think they do it because they're that aggressive in their sales. It's just that they just haven't been taught that there's a better way. I think that there's a more effective way to leverage LinkedIn. Yeah. So and do you think maybe some of the reasons why they're being pushed or well, some of the reasons why they're doing what they are, which is, you know, let's call it pitch and connect for a, a generic term, is that they're being pushed to generate sales from social from somewhere else? Or is it such as their boss? Or do you think that it's just a complete lack of, a, lack of awareness? I think the answer to that question is a resounding yes all the way around. I, right. I think it's, it's happening and, you know, they're pressured for their quotas. So they found this new channel. And so rather than making 10 phone calls, 10 cold calls, they can just send 10 connection requests with a pitch on it and count that the same way. Yeah. And the results are probably about the same. Yeah. But also there are sales managers that are discovering this thing called LinkedIn, and they're taking what worked with email marketing, and they're trying to plug that into, into LinkedIn. And they're taking what they know as social media marketing, and they're trying to to use that or pass that off as social selling, which they're really different. What we define, I love, I love the definition that we came up with for social selling because there's a few definitions out there. And it, it's leveraging online tools and platforms such as LinkedIn to attract, teach, and engage your target and buyers in order to have more sales conversations. And the last part is the most important part. In order to have more sales conversations, LinkedIn and social selling can boost or, or I guess the word would be enhance all of your other sales activities. Everything that you've been taught to do, whether it's personal meeting people, whether it's cold call techniques or calling techniques or networking te techniques, that can all be enhanced with social selling and with LinkedIn. Yep, absolutely agree. And I think if we go back to those connection requests, a lot of people don't understand the lifespan of those poor outreaches in relation to the two-party relationship. So if I send you a really bad connection request or I, you and I connect and then I pitch you straight away, when I go back to your, when I want to send you a message in two years' time, guess what's still there? That very bad message. But when you go to message me just three days later, what you're going to find out is that we're not connected <laughs> because I won't connect with, with those people. And that's what I think one of the things that people need to understand is, is you are the gatekeeper to your network. This is your personal network that you're building. And, you know, we like to say there's the lions, you know, the LinkedIn open networkers that will take a connection request from anybody. Yes. And a lot of that has to do with vanity metrics and they just want to show big numbers. And that's great. If that's what you're into, that's fine. You know, but then there's the purists that will only connect with people that they know, only connect with people within their industry. 
and, and they've got a very small network, but they know everyone. And then there's the networkers. And I believe as people in sales, we need to be networkers. But in doing that, you have to evaluate who you're allowing into your network. So when I get a connection request, if it's got a note that pitches to me right away, I will typically send them back something and say, listen, this isn't how I use LinkedIn. This is all about you. It's not about me. I want to network with people and I'll send them some resources. And among those resources will be something on Connections 101, which is a slide share I did just on here are some tips about connecting in a better way. I'm trying not to preach at them because I know that they don't know any better. But if they have not sent me a connection request, I'm going to send them back. I send every single person back the same message. This is the only automation I do on LinkedIn is I copy and paste the message from the others that I sent it to that says, hey, Mark, thanks for the connection request. I typically only connect with people I've met or I've had engagement with here on LinkedIn. Can you tell me how you found me and what triggered the connection request? So what I've done is, you know, if you picture playing tennis, I've hit the ball back in your court. It's up to you what you do. And that way it forces that person to tell me and give me some context as to why they want to connect with me. Hey, let's take a quick break and take care of a little bit of business. We'll be right back. If you need more conversations with your ideal buyers or to simply sharpen your prospecting skills, check out Mark's latest book, Tactical Pipeline Growth. It's a complete prospecting guide. It outlines step-by-step the process to build a strong and healthy pipeline. Mark has included a huge amount of valuable sales material, such as templates, call and email scripts, the best cadence plans, as well as social selling templates for you to use and start prospecting straight away. Tactical Pipeline Growth is available from Amazon or directly from www.markmc.co slash tpg. Okay, let's get back into the podcast. And how many of those people would reply out of interest? So let's say you get you know 20 connection requests and 10 of them don't include a, a note and you send 10 notes back. What's the response rate? About six to seven will send a note back. And out of those six to seven messages, two or three will be sales pitches. In fact, some have automation set up that as soon as a message is generated, it reads it as a connection request that's been accepted. So I'll get something back that says, thanks for connecting with me. And it pitches their product. And then I send another note back and say, you're obviously using automation because you didn't read that. I haven't connected with you yet. But for the most part, you know, like there will be a few that will, you know, hey, I saw this post that you did here, or I did some research and I found you, I found out that you help people with LinkedIn, or I know Bryn, and so she recommended we connect. And it's those people that just don't understand that you can send a note, or LinkedIn's part of the problem because we know that about 50% of the people that are accessing LinkedIn are accessing it from the mobile app. And as you know, if you click connect on the mobile app, like you do on the desktop, it sends the connection request right away. That's correct. Yeah, you've got it. But what a lot of people don't understand is you can actually, if you do that, you can actually go back into the per, send a personal invite and send that note after the fact. Yeah. So look, I actually want to, want to share an example with you about automation. That's exactly what you talked, talked about and get your thoughts about that. And so I was recently sent a connection request that was clearly a pitch and looked like very looked like it was automated from a university here in Australia trying to get me to sign up for an MBA. And there was a question at the end, you know, so you had to reply, were you interested? And I I replied saying, I'm pretty sure I replied saying, no, thanks. And straight away, like immediately, I got a, another message saying, that's great, Mark. When's a good time to hook up for a conversation? You know, so it was clearly like an automated. So I thought, you know what, I'll reply back with yes and see what happens. And so I replied back with yes. And it came back, that's great, Mark. When's a good time to get a meeting? And this was under one gentleman's profile. So it wasn't, you know, a corporate sponsored in mail. It was, let's say it was coming from Mark McGuinness, the business development manager for XYZ University. And I I pondered that for a while. And I thought, this is really trashing this poor young man's individual profile because obviously this is being sent out to a lot of people. And whoever replies gets the same message, whether you reply yes or no. And even if you're interested, you're straight away going, well, this is fairly inauthentic, right? So like you, I'm a bit pent up about some of these things. So I sent him a message and he didn't reply. And after a day or two, I thought, you know what, I'm actually going to look for his boss. And I sent a message to his boss. And of course, we weren't connected. 
as a sales manager. And what do you think the boss said to me? I don't know. Don't spam me. <laughs> oh, wow. That's... <laughs> So I sent a message back and saying, let's call that his boss, Bill, right? So I said, hey, Bill, I'm not sure if you're aware, but you know, I'm pretty uncomfortable with what you're doing to Mark's profile. If he's a, not a real person, then you're breaching the, the guidelines of LinkedIn. If he is a real person, you know, this poor kid sending out hundreds of messages to people that's automated, and it makes it really difficult for him going forward. Here's a link to a couple of my webinars for free that talk about building a messaging structure that's a little bit more authentic. So that was it. And his message was, don't spam me. Don't, don't spam me. I sent a message to the marketing manager and I haven't heard back yet, but not expecting to. And last week, just to finish this off, Bill, I got the same message from the same kid again. I'm surprised it wasn't from someone else in the, in the department because, and, and unfortunately, if you're listening to this podcast and you have LinkedIn lead generation in your title or you work for a company that does that, I don't want this to be personal, but LinkedIn lead generating people do this all the time. I'll get the same automated response from one. And then as soon as I reply back and I don't, and I ignore them, then I get it from another. And it's like, you, they don't talk to each other. And, and you said it, you said, you talked about inauthentic. And that's, I think the thing that we really need to hone in on as salespeople, as people in business development, we want to be authentic in our outreach. And when you're doing mass outreach, you're just, you can't be authentic. Like I said, the only way that I'll do automation is I'll copy and paste the same message for people that have sent me a message and they haven't put a personal note in. But even if I'm, if, even if I've done a webinar and I've got 50 or 60 follow-up emails to send where it would be easy to do a copy and paste email, I still try to go in and make it just a little authentic, a little bit personal. Because if you don't do that, you're just like everyone else. And it's kind of sad to say that the way you differentiate yourself nowadays on LinkedIn is by being authentic. That's a sad statement. Well, yes, but it's actually easier than what a lot of people think. I think people listen to us and think that, you know, we've somehow got some magic tools, but I liked the what you were doing. So people were sending you a connection request without a message and you were using that as an excuse to start a conversation. And if we go back to, you know, what, the whole concept for social selling was for you, Bill, was, was to start a sales conversation, right? So you're staying true to that by saying, hey, Mark, you haven't sent me a connection report. You haven't sent me a, a private message, a, a personalized message. Can you just give me a rundown on, on why you want to connect and why you didn't do that? That forces me to start a conversation. And some of those times, not all of them, but some of those times are going to be, like you said, I really like your post around sending a personalized connection request. And I thought I'd get more access to that information if we we're going to be connected. Now, that's a, a perfect opportunity for a, a somewhat warm lead for you. So you can go, sure, what sort of stuff are you interested in? I've got a bunch of resources here I can send you. Or did you know about the book or whatever the case may be? So it's just a, a really, it can be very, very simple. It doesn't need to be overthought. And I think a lot of people think that the easiest way for them to do that is to create some sort of complicated message campaign through automation. And I'm not a fan at all. Yeah. And the thing is, is they're not the ones that are creating it. What they're doing is they're handing that whole process over to a company that doesn't know them, that doesn't speak in their language, and that doesn't know their clients. And they're giving all of that to that company because that's the easy way out. Yeah. And because they think that to be active on LinkedIn and to do really well at it, you have to spend hours and hours and hours and you don't. You know, my morning routine is look at my notifications and engage on people who have mentioned me, commented on me, say hi to people who had birthdays and that part. Then I go and I manage my network. I do just what I just, I accept connection requests. I send messages back for people connection requests. Then I engage in people's content and then I'm done. Then I'm up. That takes me maybe 20 minutes. And I think what it is, is that people think that it has to be this long drawn out process when really what it needs to do is it needs to be consistent and so there's a book called Atomic Habits I read over a year ago by James Clear. And he had one sentence that rocked my world when it comes to LinkedIn. He said, we don't rise to the level of our goals. We fall to the level of our systems. And so if you have a system in place in using LinkedIn and you faithfully and consistently work that system, you're going to be successful. It's just a matter of you're going to have that habit put into place because you work the system. 
Yeah, 100% agree. And listeners, if you haven't read Atomic Habits by James Clear, give it a read. It's really a fantastic way to build in some new habits and systems. I actually read that at the start of, um, at the end of last year. Great, great book. I might put that book in the, in the show notes, Bill. Thanks for that reminder. So you were talking earlier about we've got an obligation to build a good network. Can you expand a little bit on that, particularly in relation to the impacts that would have on the other people in our network? Sure. So the whole idea of networking is so that you and I, so we, we can build this symbiotic relationship. We can build a relationship that can be mutual beneficial. And listen, that mutual benef- benefit doesn't have to come down to just money. It can come from knowledge. It can come from, from a peer relationship. You know, I've been, I was a member of a BNI group and I'm, I'm pretty sure they're in Australia, Business Networkers International. In fact, the web guy that suggested that I start doing LinkedIn training was my wife's BNI mentor. And one of the reasons I stayed in that group for a while was not because I was making a lot of money from leads, but because I had these relationships with these other business owners that understood me like the way my other friends who had normal nine to five jobs didn't understand me. So the whole idea of building a network is so that we can have this relationship. And so if you're careful about who you're letting into your LinkedIn network, then you're going to feel more comfortable, again, having a conversation around whatever it may be. I mentioned that that we've done some LinkedIn training in Bermuda. So we went there, Bryn and I went down and my wife joined us. We went in November and we taught uh, for the bank that wanted to use us. Through another relationship I had, we did a, a webinar, a seminar, a live seminar for entrepreneurs for a group called the Ignite Accelerator Hub. And we got to know some people there. That relationship led me to a gentleman here in the States who has a meeting of the minds network that's led me to probably five other people. You know, it's one thing touching another thing, touching another thing. The way that it works is you have to start off with authenticity and with setting a relationship in in the right way. And, And listen, it may not, always happen the right way. Like if you went through the the connections I've made and the people I've allowed in my LinkedIn network in the last 10 days and said how many I've had had conversations with, it would only be a handful. But what I would tell you is that handful was done deliberately because either they reached out to me or I reached out to them so that we could continue the relationship. And so I'm kind of beating around it, but you asked about how that has to do with the rest of your network because LinkedIn, at the heart of what it can do for you is give you warm referrals. And there are people that you know who know the people that you want to know. And so what I say to everyone is evaluate every network, every every networking relationship coming from LinkedIn. So if you receive the connection request, you look at that person, you look at their profile. And what I do is I'm they have to give me a reason to ignore or reject their connection request. Yeah. And that reason typically is around pitching and trying to sell to me. But even if I reach out to them and they say, oh, hey, wow, I never thought of it that way. I've never seen, I've never seen it that way. Then I'm going to allow them in my network because I can teach them. I can provide value for them. And who knows, maybe they'll become a client. But as you're allowing people in your network, you have to realize that they're going to want to know people that you know, and you're going to want to know people that they know. And that's really the magic. I think that's what Bryn talked about when she was on just a few weeks ago was that magic because LinkedIn, Bryn is the master at using and leveraging LinkedIn for networking. Yeah. And it all starts with the network that you're building. I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. That's okay. You've sort of talked about the good side of, of the network. And, you know, we've been talking a little bit about some of the things what not to do. But I think there's the opposite side as well. So if you're one of these people who, and it's your network, so you can accept connection requests if, or, you know, without looking at them if you wish, you can, it's completely up to you. I don't advocate that at all. But, you know, you mentioned that there was three types of people, people who connected with only people that they shook hands with and did, did work with, people who were networkers, people like you and I who built a deliberate network. And then there was people who just almost connected with anybody that sent them a connection request. And I think in that last bracket, you've got, you know, you're letting a whole bunch of people who may not have good intentions into your broader network. So if you and I are connected with that individual and they're just connecting with everybody, that's where, sometimes where you get those pitch and connect type of people that you don't know that are just coming in. You know, you're opening your network up basically to to people who may not be. The riffraff. 
The riffraff. Thank you, Bill, for using a word. I couldn't find the right word there. Very well done. Yeah, so I think we've got an obligation to look after the people that we're connected to and only let good people into our network because, you know, we all know how the second and the third connections work, right? You and I connect to a whole bunch of people as second connections together. We're connected, but, you know, there'll be a whole bunch of people that our networks overlap. And if you let in a whole bunch of riffraff, thank you, you know, then they can also now see, get access to me much easier. So I think it's, we've got an obligation to do, as you said, and, you know, disconnect from them if then they're not the right people so they don't get access more broadly. Absolutely. You know, we all know the golden rule, which is to treat others the way that we want to be treated. But then there's also the platinum rule. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the platinum rule. No, please. The platinum rule is to treat others the way that they want to be treated. Okay. And see, so we have to start with the golden rule, because if I don't know you, Mark, I don't know how you want to be treated. So I'm going to treat you the way that I want to be treated. I'm going to send you a personal connection request. If you don't send me a personal note when you're trying to connect with me, I'm going to send you a note. I'm not going to get offended by the fact that you're not sending me that note. You may not know any better. But as soon as we make a connection, once we're part of each other's network, once we start establishing a relationship, now it's up to me to develop the relationship and find out how you want to be treated, whether that's in business or personal or on LinkedIn. You know, do you want, there's people that tag anybody and everybody on their posts on LinkedIn and they haven't received permission. And so that's one of the things to find out, hey, is it okay? So I'll ask you, so Mark, when I'm promoting this on LinkedIn for this podcast, are you okay if I tag you in that post? Absolutely. I would hope that you do. Okay. So that's good. So I think the golden rule and platinum rule are important that we need to treat people the way that we want to be treated until we've established a relationship with them. And then it's up to us to find out how, how they want to be treated. And listen, that goes for business too. It goes with the clients that we're servicing. There was a post the other day about how do you communicate with your, with your clients? I said the way that they want to be communicated with. We've got a client down in New York City who's an older gentleman who hates email and he's not on any social at all. Believe it or not, when he wants something, he picks up the phone and he calls us. Yeah. So when we want to get information from him, we don't send him an email. We pick up the phone and we call him. So I think that that's important. And I think when we start practicing the, the golden rule and the platinum rule, we really begin to develop a, a quality network that you know has that air of reciprocity so that people are treating us the right way also. I love that, the platinum rule. I think I might use that as the headline for the podcast episode. That's awesome. A couple of quick questions for you, if you wouldn't mind. I ask everybody these two questions. The first one, do you think social is getting better or have we already seen the best days come and go? I think it's getting better. I mean, you know, Microsoft spent $26 billion, I say billion with a B, to buy LinkedIn. And while there are people that are complaining about the Facebookization and, you know, there's you have stories down there now, right? LinkedIn stories has come out in Australia. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So we don't have it yet. So they're testing that. So there's those things. I think it will make it better. Will there be a will there be a quality issue in terms of content? And I think we're already seeing that there's a lot of influence out, influencers out there. But as long as it stays a networking site, I don't think LinkedIn or social is going to go anywhere. It, it, it's We have to find a way to adapt to whatever changes they bring, whatever they add to it. We've got to adapt and make that work for us. Yeah, I think that's that's on the money. And, and I think the last three months, four months have just made that even more concrete. Absolutely. So if people have been listening to this 30-odd minutes and they were going to take one key message away from the conversation we've had with Bill McCormick, what would that be? What would you like them to do differently as a result? And I think I already know, Bill, but I'll let you go for it. Well, I'm, I'm split. So I, I have two. So if I have to pick one, I would say connect and build a, a network in an authentic way. Take some time and don't just connect with anyone, but really look and build your network authentically. And then the second one is be more consistent on LinkedIn. I did that really quick. See how I switched that in there? <laughs> I love the way you just threw that in there. No, perfect. I've got to agree. I'm a big fan of deliberately building a network that's going to give you some value and not just connecting with everyone. So we're 100% aligned there. Now, Bill, this might be a bit of a tricky question in light of what you've just said. We've got people that are very focused on LinkedIn and social selling. We've got some fans on this podcast. Are you interested in connecting with them or is there a way that they can get in contact with you? Can you give us some guidelines around if we've got Mary's listening to the pod and would like more details? What's the best way to go about that? Sure. So 
connect with me on LinkedIn, but please send me a, a message and tell me that you heard me on, on the podcast. So there are a lot of Bill McCormick's on LinkedIn. So if you put in Bill McCormick and then a comma and then capital N-A-S-I, that's actually a, a an industry designation from the promotional product world. So it's Bill McCormick Massey. So yeah, so I get a lot of um, automation that's dear Massey. So they can do that. They can email me, bill at socialsaleslink.com, or they can go to socialsaleslink.com, our website, and right in the middle of the front page, they can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we've got some really exciting things that are coming out in just the next few weeks that we're, we're really looking forward to. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. And listeners, the regular listeners will know I say this every week. I'm not saying this for you, Bill. If you want to get in contact with me, please send me a personalized connection request. Tell me that you heard me on the pod. I'd be more than happy to connect with you, uh, particularly if you're in sales or sales leadership. Bill McCormick, thanks very much for joining us on the Boss Podcast. Great, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. I had a blast. It was a great time. Good stuff. And uh, listeners, let's catch you all next week. Make sure you share this with your friends and colleagues if you found it of value. Thank you very much and have a great day. Please help others just like you find this podcast by spreading the word. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and rate us wherever you source your podcasts. Thank you for listening to the Boss Podcast. Join us next time for even more tactics, discussion, and ideas to help you improve your social outreach.